Director Rachel Gregg and Policy Analyst Angela Hanks will discuss Congress's unfinished business from 2013, including funding for fiscal year 2014, extension of the Emergency Unemployment Comp Compensation Program, and trade adjustment assistance, both having expired at the end of 2013, WIA reauthorization, the Farm Bill, which also authorizes the SNAP Employment and Training Program, and the debt ceiling, which will turn back on in early February, as well as other items on the agenda for 2014. For those unfamiliar with National Skills Coalition, we have a vision of America that grows its economy by investing in its people so that every worker in every industry has the skills to compete and prosper. We do this by organizing broad-based coalitions seeking to raise the skills of America's workers across a range of industries by advocating for public policies that invest in what works as informed by our members' real-world ex expertise and by communicating these goals to an American public seeking a vision for a strong U.S. economy that allows everyone to be part of its success. Before I hand things over to Rachel, I would like to take a moment to thank all of our financial supporters calling in today. These updates are among the many state and federal policy resources that National Skills Coalition provides for those in the workforce field and are made, available, uh, made possible by the generosity of our foundation and philanthropic partners organizational supporting members, and individual donors. We hope that those of you who have not yet invested in our work will consider joining the individuals and organizations across the country who have made their contribution to move our common skills agenda forward. You can join us at www.nationalskillscoalition.org backslash get involved to make an individual donation, become an organizational supporting member, or both. We've got a lot to cover this afternoon, and we wanted to make sure we make time for your questions. So without further delay, I'm pleased to turn it over to Rachel Gregg. Rachel? Thanks, Josh, and thanks to everybody who's taking time on a Friday afternoon to listen to this call. Um, uh, we're going to structure the call around sort of three broad issue areas. So first, we're going to start with some um, update on where things are on the funding front. Um, we're going to talk about what Congress is doing, and then we're also going to talk about some activity that's going on with the administration. Um, but there has been some recent activity around funding, finally. Um, we seem to have moved past this um, sort of uh, habit Congress had of lurching from one fiscal crisis to another. Um, and it has been, well, only by comparison, but it has been a relatively smooth uh, process for the last couple of months as they try and figure out how to fund um, the fiscal year that we're in, FY14. Um, but we need to take a step back to the end of last year. Uh, if you remember, we had the government shut down in the fall. And in order, the, the legislation that ended the government shutdown and started the funding flowing again, part of that deal was this bipartisan budget act. Um, and this was sort of the start of the process that we have seen Really, it ran through November, December, and now into January, where they really were able to work out FY14 spending. But the Bipartisan Budget Act um, is legislation. It was negotiated by um, Congressman Paul Ryan, who's the chair of the House Budget Committee, and Senator Patty Murray, who's the chair of the Senate Budget Committee. What they did is they set the overall spending levels for FY2014 and 2015. Um, this was one of the big problems that we've had in the last few years. The House was setting very, very low overall spending levels. The Senate was at a much higher level, and they could never really reach agreement. So they would sort of proceed down separate parallel tracks, but we never really got any closer to having final products. And so the fact that they were able to come up with an overall spending level that both the House and the Senate um, agreed to, not just for 2014, but also 2015, is an encouraging sign, and it really should smooth the waters a little bit. So um, we, we sort of know now where we're starting for the next two years. Um, the way they were able to reach an agreement, though, is this was a very modest effort. So you may have heard in the past, you've heard me talk about, you've heard others talk about efforts to reach sort of a grand bargain, where they figured out ways to um, move towards reducing the federal debt and the federal deficit, dealing with revenue increases. Um, maybe reforming entitlement, trying to deal with discretionary appropriations. They really didn't even bother to pretend like they were going to do that this time. What they did is they just looked for things. Is there anything at all that we can agree upon, we can agree upon so that we can move forward in some way? So no big discussions. There was no big drama and really no pretense that they were even going to try to reach a grand bargain. 
Instead, what they really set out to do was just um, figure out if they could do some small sequester relief. We do have general agreement now pretty much across party lines and with most of the members of Congress that the sequester is just simply too blunt an instrument, that they've really damaged a number of discretionary funded programs in ways that are going to be difficult to recover from without really doing a lot to address the deficit or the debt. They admit that discretionary spending is not the driver of the majority of federal spending and that it's just not really good policy and it was never meant to be permanent policy. If you remember, this question was created with the idea that it was so horrible that it would force Congress to act in other, you know, to, to prevent it and the fact that it's now sort of standing policy was, was never where we meant, where Congress meant to be. So they were able to reach an agreement not to undo the sequester permanently and not to even completely undo it um, in the short term, but there is some sequester relief. So um, in 2014 and 2015, there's about $63 billion in sequester relief. Um, it's front loaded in 2014, so there's about $45 billion in sequester relief in 2014, which means that there's less than $20 billion in 2015. It's equally divided between defense and non-defense programs. So by the time you get down to it, it is relatively small amounts of money. I know we're talking about billions of dollars, but in terms of the federal budget, in terms of the non-defense discretionary programs, um, in 2014, it's about uh, $22 billion in additional funding above the sequester levels. Um, so it's you know, it's better than nothing, and it certainly is better than additional cuts, but it is not a permanent solution to the problem that we have, and it provides relatively limited relief for these programs and have already faced um, several years of deep cuts um, before 2014. <clears throat> the other thing that's important about this, though, is it's not just that it gives some sequester relief, but it also returns to regular order, or it's the start of a return to regular order, and it allowed the appropriations process to move forward. And Regular order just means that you go back to the way things are supposed to happen. And in, again, instead of this sort of stumbling from one crisis to another, reaching you know the brink of total collapse and only managing to do something at the last possible second or not being able to do anything at all, um, it, what has happened in the last few months and what we think, what we hope will continue to happen is it does create now some sort of um, predictability and stability in how um, federal funding, the process to fund these programs should go forward at least this year and probably next year. Um, so Jen, do you want to go to the next slide? So what happened in, um, you get the balanced budget, uh, I'm sorry, the bipartisan budget agreement that then lets the appropriators move forward. So they have their top line funding level that was set in the bipartisan budget agreement. So you get this 1.012 trillion top line allocation. So that means for all the federal spending, the discretionary federal spending that we're going to do in 2014, that's the total dollar amount that they have to spend for all of those programs in 2014. Um, that is below the 2013 sequester level. So you can see we had $1.132 trillion total to spend on discretionary funding in 2013. So um, it is, it's already, you can see it is lower than 2013. Um, but it is above what was supposed to be the sequester level in 2014, which was supposed to be $967 billion. So they basically, they sort of split it in the middle. It's lower than where we were. It's lower than where the President wanted to be. It's lower than where the Senate wanted to be. But it's well above where the House wanted to be at that um, sequester level. In this chart, though, you, t it kind of gives you a little bit of context. So you can see um, we're well below where the President wanted to be in FY14. We're below where um, spending was in 2010. We're below where the Senate wanted to be in FY14. We're even below what um, uh, Chairman Ryan proposed in his original budget resolution um, for FY14. And in fact, the closest place that you can go back to see where this funding level is is FY09 spending, uh, not adjusted for inflation. So we're below, FY14 spending levels are below FY09 spending levels. Um, not even adjusted for inflation. So it's, it's not as much money as we need. Um, 
What does that mean for workforce funding? So, and this is good, this is true of a lot of the discretionary programs. This sort of pattern. Um, most of the workforce programs are funded above the FY 2013 post sequester level. So, if you remember in 2013, the way 2013 worked is in early 2013 we got pre sequester funding levels, and then a few months later they came through and made a round of cuts, and then we were at the post sequester funding levels. So there's sort of two benchmarks that we can compare FY14 to, where we were pre-sequester and where we were post-sequester. And so compared to post-sequester, funding in 2014 is above, for the most part for workforce programs, is above the post-sequester levels. So if you just think about it in terms of absolute dollars, if you're running a program in 2014, you will get more money than you had by the end of 2013. After they took those cuts, after they took the sequester cuts back, the amount of money that will go down to most programs in 2014 will be more money than we had in the final analysis in 2013. Um, there are two exceptions to that. So the adult basic education, state grants, the um, uh, adult basic education and English language civics education, state grants. Those are, in 2014, those are funded level with the post-sequester 2013 funding levels. And the Wagner Pizer Employment Service State Grants are actually just under the 2013 post sequester level, um, about a million dollars below the 2013 post sequester level. So those two programs are actually below. They, it it will they will see no increase or actually lose a little bit of money compared to where we finished in 2013. The other programs will see a, at least some bump up. Um, but for all of the workforce programs, even the ones that are above the post sequester level. Um, they're almost all below the pre-sequester level. So we aren't even restored. The cuts that were made in 2013 as part of the sequester, those cuts are not fully restored. So we're not even all the way back to the original FY13 levels, let alone where we'd like to be, which is um, you know, something like 2010, which was the last year before these cuts started. So we're not even all the way back up to the pre-sequester FY13 levels. Um, and sort of the main message in this is, the funding for FY 2014, the good news is it doesn't make the problem worse. And it could have. If they had not done the sequester relief, we would actually be facing cuts in 2014. So that's not a small thing. The fact that there are no additional cuts, or not deep additional cuts in 2014, is a big step. But it doesn't really do anything to make the problem better either. So the cuts that have occurred already, we're not seeing a lot of those cuts restored. So in some ways, we're just sort of holding the line. Um, and Jen, if you'll flip out and go to the funding chart. So I know this is tiny, tiny type, and you guys probably can't see a lot of this. Um, and this is available on our website. Um, when you get the follow-up email on, telling you the recording of this webinar, you'll get a link. There'll be a, a, UR, a URL to where you can find this chart. But the reason I wanted to show you this chart is if you look at um, the gray column here, the sort of dark gray column, the one that says FY 2013 post sequester versus FY 2014. So you can see, in general, it's, they're positive numbers. So we have gained funding over 2013. If you look at the light blue column next to it, where you look at the um, pre-sequester levels, you can see all the red, all the negative. So that's where we're losing that funding um, from the original 2013 levels. Uh, we gain some of it back above the post-sequester level. And if you look at the these last two columns, the beige and the green, going back to 2010, you can see we're still significantly down from where we were in 2010 for most workforce development programs, um, uh, except for Pell. Pell has still gone up quite a bit. But um, go, go down a little bit, Jen. Go down. Stop. That 14.25% there, that is... Um, about the percentage that we've lost in funding for um, Department of Labor funded workforce programs since 2010. So you can see we're still down quite a bit. Um, and you'll get this chart and you'll, you can look at it as much as you want um, and not have to deal with such the tiny type. Um, OK, so go to the next slide. The one other thing that I do want to make sure people are aware of, in the omnibus there were a couple of policy changes. <clears throat> I think in general people wanted to see this change. It might not be as much as everybody wanted to see, but they did. Um, if you in 2011, if most people will remember, they lowered the WIA statewide set aside or the governor set aside for.
from 15% down to 5%. They've now taken that back up to 8.25%, not all the way to 15, but at least it's um, a little bit of an increase, I guess. Um, they also increased the transfer authority between WIA adult and dislocated worker funding streams to from 20% to 30%. So two policy changes in the bill. Um, and then what does all this mean? Where do we go from here? So as I said, the, this is all sort of a temporary reprieve, right? So modest deal for a short-term solution. Uh, the sequester will mostly go back into effect in 2015. Like I said, there's about um, $20 billion in sequester relief total in 2015, evenly divided between defense and non-defense. So um, all of the discretionary programs will only see about $10 billion in sequester relief in 2015. And then the sequester will be completely back in effect in 2016. So this really is only a short-term solution. Um, and I do think there's going to be a challenge because Congress, they worked really hard, and this was not an easy thing for them to do. The budget deal does reflect this sort of agreement that the sequester should be undone, but it also demonstrates the difficulty in doing so. They could only get to $63 billion total. Um, they had to offset the, the sequester relief with other cuts in other places, and this is all they could come up with. Um, you know, and I think the challenge for advocates and for people who rely on this funding is how do we not let this just become the norm? Like if Congress is exhausted, they have a budget resolution, they have a top line funding number for 2015 now, so it's not even clear that they'll do a budget resolution in 2015. So where is this conversation going to occur? What is the vehicle where we can, you know, continue to say to Congress, okay, we appreciate that 2014 wasn't as bad as it could have been, but this is not a permanent solution. And we're going to fall off a cliff in 2016 um, if you don't find a permanent balanced alternative to the sequester. It's just going to turn back on in, um, you know, in a, another uh, year and a half, and we, we'll be right where we were before. So I do think part of the challenge for us is how do we continue to engage Congress? How do we make them understand that they aren't done? This is a short-term solution, and they need to. We really need a long-term alternative solution to this sort of us. This endless austerity frame where all we do is cut and cut and cut and cut. Um, okay, so uh, we can stop there to take some questions. I know it's always a lot of information and there's a lot of details about the budget and I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them. All right, well, once again, if you have a question, please click on the, the hand on the control panel, left-hand side of the control panel. And it looks like right now we have one question from uh, Alice Pichard. I'm going to open up your line. And it looks like that went away. Um, so <laughs> I, have some, <laughs> I have some other questions, though, that have come in. Um, when you say sequester is back on in 2015, when precisely would that take place? That's from David Crow. So there's a really complicated technical answer to that question, but the short answer is, um, so the fiscal year 2015 starts in September of this year. The sequester, if they don't fix it, um, would turn on in January of 2015. So if they stayed actually on the schedule they're supposed to stay on, we would get our FY15 uh, spending levels in, in October, October 1st of 2014. Um, if we are above the budget caps, the sequester turns on in January. Um, again, we have some sequester relief in 2015, so it wouldn't be as deep. Um, we'd get about $10 billion in relief, but you'll still see additional cuts. So the sequester is triggered every year in January. Um, we have another question from Larry Eisenstadt. Uh, what methodologies will uh, National Skills Coalition used in 2016 to roll back the sequester? That's a really good question, and I don't know that I can answer it uh, in full. I mean, part of what we have tried to do um, is we have really tried to document the consequences of the cuts, not just from the sequester, but the ongoing cuts. So we have been losing money. Uh, workforce programs have lost money really for years and years. Um, if you look back to 2001, 2002, it's been a slow, steady slide. But it really accelerated in 2010. We've lost more than a billion dollars just since 2010. So we've really tried to document the impact of those cuts. 
Um, we've tried to help policymakers understand that it has a direct impact on the economy, that employers have job openings that they can't fill. Um, even while the unemployment rate is high and that one thing you can do to help solve that problem is to invest in occupational training and skills development. It's not the whole solution, but it's part of the solution. Um, and we will continue to do that. We will continue to lift up the best practices, all the good things that you all are doing on the ground, to show results to show that we can put people back to work. Um, but I, you know, how we're going to get this Congress to break loose of this idea that you can just keep cutting these programs, you know, that's a challenge because the, it's sort of a three-legged stool. If you're talking about the money that the federal government has to spend, and if you want more of it or you want the deficit to go down, you can increase revenue that's coming in, you can address the cost of the entitlement programs, or you can address the spending that we spend on discretionary programs. The reason why discretionary programs have been targeted so much is because that's the easiest thing to to sort of come after. We do it every year. It's 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 sort of an ongoing debate. They don't have the same political constituencies necessarily as programs, the entitlement programs like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, which I, which I'm not advocating cutting, um, and they don't have the same resistance as you know the revenue conversation. So I do think that at some point Congress is going to have to come and have a more holistic conversation about all the parts of spending and revenue if we ever want them to stop just cutting the discretionary programs. And that's a that's a heavy lift, but that's you know, that's the work that we're trying to do. I have a couple of questions here from Phyllis Cummins. Um, it appears the senior community service employment uh, program remained in the DOL budget for twenty fourteen rather than being transferred to ACL as the draft budget proposed. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And then her other question is, what about funding for pilot projects? There was $25 million in the draft budget for older worker research projects and also fund for, funds for uh, Workforce Innovation Fund grants. Where does this funding stand? So I don't know about the first grant. I don't think that's a Department of Labor grant because I – I'm not aware of $25 million in pilot projects for the Department of Labor. That might have been through HHS or another agency. So I don't know the answer to that question. The Workforce Innovation Fund still exists. Um, it's just below $50 million. I think they have about $47 million this year. Um, that's down from $125 million in 2011, though. So, you know, again, we've been losing money. Um, Pilots and demos at the Department of Labor is gone, so they have wiped it out. There is, it, it, it has been going down steadily. Last year there was $6 million at the Department of Labor for pilots and demos. That money is gone in 2014. Um, I can't speak to all the other agencies, though, so other agencies may still have pilots and demos money, but the Department of Labor does not. Uh, Joe Millman uh, just wants a clarification. He says that uh, he believes that the slide showing Governor set aside was um, – was at 8.25 percent, and yeah. he thought it was uh, set at 8.75 percent. Um, we can double check that. I thought it was 8.25 percent. It could be 8.75. Um, we can double check that. But it it has gone up either 8 to 8.25 or 8.75. Um, so some increase, but we'll, we'll double check. Katie Cash in this. Um, wrote in that uh, the set-aside, uh, she just confirmed that the set-aside uh, at 8.75. Okay. Uh, she just wrote that in. All right. Uh, All right. Sorry about that. Randy Johnson uh, from Workforce Development, Inc., uh, is there any change in notice of funds for the first quarter of this coming year? Is there any change in the percentage of our annual allowance in the first quarter? Um, I'm not 100% sure which program you're asking about. And that's a technical question that's probably better for the, one of the agencies. Um, in general, I think that you will, like if you're talking about we are adult or dislocated worker, they probably won't do it until you get the later allotment. If it's youth, you get that a lot, you get, you'll get your funds in April. So it probably depends on when the program allocation it goes out. He's asking about we are adult. We are adult. My guess is it won't be until the July allocation. I, I would not expect them to um, 
to change the allocations mid sort of midstream. But I don't know. But that's a be that question is is uh, better suited for DOL than than for me because I'm just guessing. Then uh, Monica Rodriguez, uh, what can you tell us about the USDE first in the world funding? Is it true that it's modeled after the investing innovation grant from USDE? I don't know the answer to that question. It's not a program that we have paid close attention to. I'm sorry. Um, that's all the questions that I have right now. Okay. Um, well, so if you come up with, a, if there are other questions about funding, we can always come back to it. But I do want to give Angela a chance to talk about what is going on in Congress, um, because there is actually a lot of activity and there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, so Angela, if you wanna, if you wanna uh, give people an update. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Rachel. So as Rachel said, um, there is quite a bit going on in Congress. Um, there are only a few. Uh, weeks into the session, but they already have a full plate and some things to take care of that they didn't get to uh, by the end of last year. So I think from uh, what Rachel discussed um, about the, um, the budget agreement, uh, one takeaway is that we are dealing with a little bit of a kinder, kinder gentler Congress. Um, I don't know if that means it's all sunshine and rainbows, but um, certainly there were some hard lessons learned during the government shutdown. Um, a lot of members uh, found it to be very politically difficult to shut down the government. I think they heard quite a bit from their constituents. Um, and I think it was uh, pretty clear to all members of Congress that Americans just didn't have the appetite for the, types of brink the type of brinkmanship that shut down the government back in October. So from that came uh, some encouraging things. So the budget deal um, in late December, the um, omnibus that was just passed this week. So um, things have been moving forward, and this is sort of a new um, reality in some ways uh, compared to the past couple of years. Uh, like I said, it's not all perfect. Um, the uh, unemployment insurance extension is one of the first things that uh, the Senate took up this year. and. So far, it has been highly partisan. Uh, the House has not moved any legislation on UI at all. Uh, and the Senate has made some attempts to move forward with a short-term extension. Uh, most recently, uh, they were working on a three-month extension of UI. However, they just haven't been able to push it through uh, for various reasons. Some members uh, want to add amendments relating to job training, others want to add amendments that are completely unrelated to UI that would have to do with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, so it was really a, a difficult process. And I'm sure uh, the Senate and the House actually will uh, continue to figure out a way to move forward on UI. But certainly, uh, just because we've gotten these budget deals does not necessarily mean that all of the uh, partisan back and forth in Congress is over. I think. Uh, Looking ahead, the next big test is going to be the debt ceiling. So uh, under the deal to reopen the government that was uh, reached in October, uh, one of the provisions required uh, the debt ceiling to be suspended until February 7th. So February 7th is uh, more of an approximate date. Uh, if it's not extended by February 7th, the Treasury Department has the option of taking what's called extraordinary measures uh, to ensure that America doesn't default on its debt. Um, there is some disagreement um, as to what, how long those extraordinary measures could take us. Um, uh, Secretary Liu, uh, Se Treasury Secretary Liu uh, believes that it's more likely that it'll be end of February, early March, and over in the Senate they're looking at April or May. So it's unclear when exactly that will come up, but it is um, certainly something that's typically uh, partisan, and I'm sure uh, we'll have to wait and see what happens with that. So another somewhat positive sign is there has been a lot of conversations about skilled workforce in the House and the Senate. Um, right here you can see um, this is just a handful of the pieces of legislation that have been introduced in both chambers relating to workforce development. Uh, Senator Stabenow, Senators Portman and Bennett, uh, the Manufacturing Jobs for America initiative, uh, which is spearheaded by Senator Coons, which includes a number of manufacturing and uh, training pieces of legislation, um, including Sectors Act, which is um, 
and that initiative is supported by Senator Coons and 25 other Democratic senators. Uh, the Community College to Career Act, which is initial, originally a proposal um, from the President that uh, Senator Franken and Rep. Miller and the House have taken up, uh, and others you can see here. And like I said, this is just uh, a fraction of the uh, bills that have been introduced, so it certainly shows that members are starting to pay attention to the need for a skilled workforce. So um, as workforce is becoming more of a topic of interest, um, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. Once you uh, get members' attention, uh, you're more likely to get some scrutiny as well, which uh, we're certainly seeing. Uh, there are, uh, I think, a number of members um, in uh, both the House and the Senate who um, have begun to express their concerns about um, sort of similar things that we've heard before about duplication of programs, wanting to decrease programs, um, divert funding, things of that nature. Um, so those are potential challenges moving ahead as um, Congress focuses more on workforce development. Um, but between the bills that I just mentioned and also these um, kind of one-off uh, interest in uh, making changes to WIA, it's still not clear how any of these pieces of legislation could move. Uh, nothing is going to move on its own right now, uh, so it's likely that it would be uh, attached to a larger vehicle. So um, clearly when we're talking about uh, skills, the obvious choice is WIA, um, although we can talk a little bit about uh, some other potential vehicles as well. So moving on to WIA, um, as there's been more of an interest in a skilled workforce, there's certainly been more interest in WIA reauthorization. I think it's safe to say that we are much closer to reauthorization of WIA than in the recent past. Uh, members are talking about it uh, in the Senate. In November, Senator Reid filed a motion to proceed, uh, which is kind of the first procedural step to getting it on the floor, uh, which is uh, certainly a good sign. Uh, and also, uh, Senator Harkin and, Senator, and uh, Chairman Klein on the House have made WIA a top priority for 2014. Senator Harkin, who's the chair of the Senate Health Education Health Committee, uh, recently has said that you know before he retires in 2014, he wants to see WIA pass. Uh, Chairman Klein has sort of made similar uh, statements about wanting to see WIA done in the 113th Congress. So certainly, those are good signs. Um, obviously, a number of hurdles remain. Um, it still is very difficult to get anything out of Congress these days, so uh, it's not a done deal just because they're thinking about it, but it certainly is a positive sign that they're thinking about it and that this is on the top of their list. Um, I'd also keep in mind that some of the uh, bills that I mentioned before and some uh, probably a number of other things um, will probably also pop up as amendments if this does get to the floor. So you can expect members who have bills out there uh, to use WIA as a vehicle to get their legislation passed. So either they'll be cutting and pasting, pulling it apart altogether, um, and trying to get it attached to WIA. As far as the timeline for WIA, it is hard to say for sure, but um, I think we're expecting that if it is going to move, it'll be sometime in the next uh, next couple of months, probably. Uh, it's more likely to go in the first half of the year than the second. So. Um, National Skills Coalition will certainly uh, keep you updated as we hear more, um, and we're keeping our ear to the ground to try to get a sense of when it'll come up and spending a lot of time uh, talking with offices, talking about amendments, uh, trying to figure out uh, where offices are on amendments and what types of things they want to see included in reauthorization. So um, I'm sure if you've realized amendments are a, a big theme of this. So. Um, in addition to those bills, we'll probably also see amendments on consolidation, uh, some more positive amendments on set-asides for training, expanding Pell access, uh, and I'm sure many more as uh, we get closer to, to the floor. Uh, I would say overall there is less support in the Senate for a Skills Act approach. That's the legislation in the House that would have, um, that if passed would consolidate 35 existing programs into a single workforce investment fund. Um, there's less ap appetite for that in the Senate. However, I wouldn't say that there's no appetite 
for it in the Senate, so I'm sure um, if WIA does get to the floor, uh, we will see some amendments that look similar to uh, those consolidation provisions in the Skills Act. So uh, WIA is not the only thing that's moving. There are a number of other big reauthorizations that have to be taken care of. I would say that WIA is um, certainly the priority given how long it's been since it was last authorized, um, but uh, the um, Education Workforce Committee and the Senate Health Committee um, are also working on Perkins and the Higher Invest Education Act. Um, Perkins, uh, they've had a couple of hearings in the House. Um, HEA, there's been a couple of hearings in the House and the Senate, so it is likely that we could see some legislation on one or both of those sometime this year. Uh, I'm not sure if both or either would be passed this year, but um, certainly seeing legislative text is an encouraging sign that they would move forward. So um, there are a few things that have yet to be uh, taken care of that were supposed to be taken care of in the last Congress, and they didn't quite get to it. So um, they're spending the beginning part of the year uh, trying to figure out how to, um, to fix these programs or to reauthorize. So um, as you, I'm sure, know, the Emergency Unemployment Compensation uh, Program expired at the end of December. Uh, so at the end of December, about 1.3 million people immediately lost access to their EUC benefits. Um, as you can see from this chart, so it's 1.3 million people now, but if you game that out until December 2014, it's going to affect about 5 million people. Uh, so the, the impact of not extending uh, emergency unemployment compensation is, is very serious for a number of Americans. Um, as I said, the House and Senate attempts to extend EUC have been very partisan. Um, the House has yet to take up any legislation. Um, and the Senate has taken up legislation and at one point did get through a major procedural hurdle uh, with a three-month month extension, but uh, wound up unable to get final passage due to issues around having a pay for um, for its legislation. Um, so a lot of the controversy has been over um, whether or not to pay for the extension, um, how to pay for it if uh, you know, we're going to concede that it should be paid for. Um, even though it's emergency spending. So um, those are some of the conversations um, that have gone on over at UC. There have also been um, some sort of non, uh, uh, more politicized proposals uh, around uh, paying for the UC um, through um, making changes to the health care law and things of that nature that are pretty much non-starters in the Senate. So. It, at this point, I would say it's unclear how they're going to move forward, but they're still working at it. I mean, clearly this is a big problem. There are a number of people who are depending on those benefits while they search for work or try to get skills to get in a better job. And, um, and they, I think that is acknowledged um, certainly in the Senate and probably in the House as well. Um, so they'll keep working on it. And I think now that they have finished up appropriations for uh, this year, they can turn back to working on UI. So in addition to unemployment insurance, uh, TAA, uh, the uh, 2011 version, um, expired at the end of last year. So when the 2011 uh, legislation expired, uh, we reverted back to the 2002 amendments. So um, the main difference in the 2002 amendments is eligibility for TAA. Uh, so now that we're back to the 2002 amendments, eligibility is more narrow. Um, so we have, we are aware that there is some potential for uh, the narrowed eligibility to impact colleges that have TAC grants. Um, I think it's too early for us to know how exactly that will impact um, those grants, but we will certainly be reaching out to um, congressional staff and to the administration to try to get some answers um, on TAA and how how the TAC grant will be affected. So um, I think it's safe to assume that there will be some efforts to, uh, to pass an extension of TAA. Uh, there's some legislation that the Senate 
uh, will have to work on at the beginning of this year on trade that could um, help move TAA. So that's certainly an opportunity. In the Senate, uh, Senators Baucus and Collins introduced in July a seven-year TAA uh, extension, which does not include, include the TAC grants. It just includes um, TAA. Um, I'm not sure a seven-year uh, extension would be something that's uh, particularly viable, but um, certainly I know that uh, Senator Baucus and Senator Collins are really committed to seeing some sort of extension of TAA. So um, we will certainly be monitoring that as they uh, start to have those discussions. So in addition to not finishing EC and TAA, uh, the Congress is also um, having a fairly difficult time getting a farm bill passed. So farm bill covers a number of things, um, including the SNAP employment and training program. Uh, so as a result of not reauthorizing the or not passing a farm bill reauthorization uh, in September. Technically, authorization for the Farm Bill has expired, although there is some disagreement about whether or not um, continued funding means continued authorization. But um, really, a lot of the uh, nutrition aspects of the Farm Bill uh, won't be impacted right away. So there is a little bit more time to keep working on this, but certainly uh, the Farm Bill conferees in the House and Senate are working quickly. Uh, the main disagreement between the House and the Senate is over uh, SNAP benefits. Uh, in the House, uh, they passed a bill that included about a $40 billion cut uh, to SNAP or food stamps. Um, the Senate bill also included a cut, but it was closer to $8 billion, um, which is not insignificant, but certainly there's a big gap between $40 billion and $8 billion. So, um, the conferees have been working hard the past couple of months to try to figure out a way to come together on the Farm Bill. Uh, I think from what we've heard at this point, they are moving closer to an agreement, so we could see it soon. Uh, this is sort of a, a must-pass piece of legislation, so uh, I think we can probably, it's safe to say that we can look out for something uh, in the next few weeks to months. So that is it for me. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions about any of this. All right. So once again, if you have a question, please click, click on the hand raising button located on the left side of your control panel. I will then open up your line to allow you to ask questions. Uh, you can also type your questions into the, the question or comment box, uh, and I'll read it for you. Uh, we do have one that, uh, that came in, uh, Larry. Eisenstadt, uh, given the uncertainties of the future, what do you see as the common elements between the House and Senate that will appear in any reauthorized WIA? So there, there are some similar provisions um, in the bill, um, although you know the, the the major point of disagreement is pretty substantial um, over consolidation. It's hard to say. I don't, I don't know that I can really guess on, on how they'll be able to come together on that. I know that they have already been talking, um, and we just haven't been privy to those conversations. It's really been at a staff level um, between the folks who are trying to negotiate the, um, the two bills and figure out what to do when they get to conference. Um, but I'm not really sure. It is a very, very large gap um, to, to try to bridge between the House and the Senate bills. So, I, I am hesitant to guess about what that would um, that would look like, but uh, we're certainly um, keeping our ear to the ground and we'll c can give updates as soon as we have have them. All right, we have another question here from Mark Tajima. Um, I'm going to open up your line. Not a hello. Hello, Mark. Hi. Hi. Yeah, hi. This is not a question. Just a clarification that SNAP does, because there's an appropriation, it definitely does not need an authorization, authorization to continue. And the omnibus even allows the funds to be available through September 30, 2015, and the $82 billion would be more than sufficient to cover SNAP through even calendar, all of calendar 2014. So that's just 
a clarification that uh, that and that's why they continued SNAP funding even during the government shutdown period in October because it does not need an authorization to continue. So that's just a comment. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, so we have another question here. What is the status of the Sectors Act? Is it going to be part of WEA? That's from uh, Jason Oscar. So uh, it's not currently in the Senate bill. Um, however, um, Senator Brown, who is the uh, original sponsor over on the Senate side, is planning to introduce it, introduce it as an amendment. Um, and uh, I think there is some increased support uh, for seeing it incorporated. So. Um, certainly, if uh, if it can be offered as an amendment, we um, will be looking to see it accepted. But um, it's not included in the base bill. All right, we have uh, another question on the line with uh, Marjorie Womack. I opened up your line. Go ahead and ask it. Looks like she's not there. Um, we have another question here. Are there any uh, are there any workforce issues tied to an immigration reform bill? So that's a great question. So actually, uh, there certainly are um, in the immigration bill that was passed in the Senate. Uh, there was a move toward uh, immigration by way of your job versus um, through family, uh, through your family. So. Um, that being said, actually, uh, National Skills Coalition has prepared some recommendations around um, getting people the skills they would need to per, uh, progress on the path to citizenship. Um, basically, um, a lot of the um, workforce development requirements are around moving um, along the path to citizenship, which is about a 13-year path. And at multiple points during that path, you either must be uh, you have to be employed uh, continuously. Um, you can't be unemployed for more than 60 days, or you have to be enrolled in education or training. So uh, many of National Skills Coalition's recommendations um, revolve around making sure that folks have uh, adequate uh, resources and ability to access education and training they would need to meet those requirements and continue on the path to citizenship. Uh, certainly, um, those are available on our website. Um, and you can also reach out to, um, to any of us for some more details on what those recommendations look like. All right, uh, so we have another question from uh, Marjorie Womack. Uh, will there be more focus on literacy services within WIA once it's on the floor? That I'm not sure about. Um, I would have to get back to you. Okay. And then we have uh, another question about WIA. Uh, what portion of the funds will be used for work, youth workforce programs? So the, um, the Senate bill doesn't actually um, authorize a specific dollar amount, so that's done through the appropriations process. So I couldn't answer that just yet. Uh, there's another question here from Jim Torrens. Uh, glad to hear the question about the Sectors Act. I understand that the Act may um, may later be introduced as an amendment to WIA, but is not now included in the base bill. Can you talk about its prospects as a standalone bill or one included in the bill you mentioned related to manufacturing? Uh, as a standalone bill, I would say the prospects are pretty slim just because nothing of that size is really moving. Um, it's got a much better chance of moving uh, with a larger piece of legislation. That said, it doesn't necessarily have to be WIA. It could be any number of pieces of legislation. WIA just seems to make the most logical sense, and it's coming up uh, first. But um, you know, if for whatever reason WIA did not move forward, which I am hesitant to even say that because I hope that is not the case, uh, then um, it could it could ride along with another uh, legislative vehicle. So just thinking about like CTE or HEA or something like that. Uh, as a standalone, I don't think so. Um, the manufacturing initiative, 
I'm not sure. I know, you know, it is certainly encouraging that there are that many senators who are willing to put their name on it. Um, however, uh, in order to bring something to the floor, you have to be pretty confident that uh, it would pass. And um, the initiative, first of all, isn't a single piece of legislation. It's several pieces kind of packaged together. Um, so it couldn't be moved all at once. Um, and it's unclear whether or not it could get enough support to actually um, clear the procedural hur hurdles um, and get voted on in the Senate. So it's possible. Um, I just think that probably looking forward, WIA is the, the best bet. OK, I don't think we have any more questions. OK. Then um, I'm going to take back over, and we're going to talk a little bit about the administration, too, um, because there's a lot of activity at the uh, White House and in the agencies um, that's really sort of happening separate from Congress. You have probably heard the President talking about just recently he's got a pen and he's got a phone, and he will do things even if Congress won't do things. He's going to try and figure out ways to do things. Um, so there's some activity there sort of independent of the legislation that Angela's been talking about. So Jen, will you go to the next slide? All right, so the White House and the President um, have been laying the groundwork for this skills agenda. And um, uh, around town, they actually use that phrase, skills agenda. I don't really think I've seen it outward facing very much yet. Um, uh, but I do think that we'll start to see more of it. So I think in the State of the Union and in the President's FY15 budget, which um, is supposed to come out in early February, it's likely going to be a little bit late this year. but. At some point, we'll see a budget from the president. And um, in talking to White House staff and agency staff, they have um, certainly suggested that there are going to be things in the budget related to workforce and skills that we're going to be pleased to see. Um, and again, they've sort of hinted, I think they're still in the process of writing it, but they've sort of hinted that there will also be some things in the State of the Union that we will potentially be happy to see. Um, but some of it has already started to move. They have these five buckets that they're, for lack of a better word, that they're focusing on. So high school reform college access, data issues, especially um, data that faces out to consumers. So how do consumers make decisions or choices about programs to enroll in, how much to spend, what kind of earnings they can expect, what kind of credential they should be getting if they want this kind of a job. So lots of sort of outwardly facing data issues. Um, also, though, some interest in inward, you know, uh, data that faces inward for continuous improvement, things like that. Um, they're very interested in the long-term unemployed. Uh, I was just listening to Gene Sperling this morning talk about the fact that we still have 4 million people who have been unemployed for 27 weeks or longer. Um, and the problems that creates where you're taking what is essentially should be a cyclical issue and potentially turning it into a structural issue. They're very interested in figuring out ways to help the long-term unemployed. And then they're also um, focused on this idea of demand-driven training. They have heard, um, I think, repeatedly from people that um, you know, training should be connected to employers. Um, particularly, they we have spent a lot of time talking to them about industry partnerships. Um, so even if we don't get the Sectors Act passed through Congress, I do think we're going to see the administration and the agencies moving in this direction, where they're really looking at intermediaries who connect training um, and employers in these, um, you know, really in an employer-led way. Um, they are looking for things they can do without Congress. The president has had a very hard time advancing his agenda through Congress, um, both because Congress has a very hard time doing anything, and also the president. Um, you know, there's just a lot of resistance if it's uh, coming from this president. There are people who just are not going to support it. Um, and this agenda coming out of the White House is really influencing a number of agencies. So we're seeing it play out in a lot of different ways. So you have the White House talking about it. You have the White House trying to think about what they can do, how they can advance these issues. Um, and then you'll have, um, we're seeing things happen in the agency sort of at the same time. So we go to the next slide, Jen. All right, so let's start with the Department of Labor. By now, hopefully everybody has had a chance to at least hear something from Secretary Perez, the new um, Labor Secretary. Uh, he's great. He's traveling around the country. He's been to a number of training sites. He was just in um, uh, Detroit at Focus Hope. Um, but he's been all over the place. Um, including some of the labor management partnerships. And he um, comes with a very, very strong background. He was the Secretary of Labor in Maryland before joining the administration at the Department of Justice and then moving over to the Department of Labor. Um, so Maryland has been a leader in 
career pathways and industry partnerships and um, credential counting and, and um, data issues. And so he brings all of that knowledge and background with him. So we think he's really just going to be a great, great partner. Um, he and uh, Secretary Pritzker, who's the new Commerce Secretary, they have been doing a lot of joint meetings um, around the country, sort of trying to talk about meeting the needs of employers and making sure workers have access to the training that they need so that they can get good jobs. And it's just really been sort of a new energy coming out of the Department of Labor at the secretary level. Um, Eric Sells now, uh, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary at ETA, he has been in the role of Acting Assistant, acting assistant Secretary um, since Jane Oates left. The White House did uh, just um, uh, recently announced that they have nominated Portia Wu uh, to be the Assistant Secretary at ETA, so to take Jane's old job. Um, Portia currently works in the White House in the Domestic Policy, Domestic Policy Council where she handles workforce issues. Um, she also does labor and some other issues, work family balance issues. Uh, she worked for Senator Kennedy before that. So she, she has um, a lot of expertise and a, lot, and a pretty extensive background on the policy side around these issues. Um, I do think it is potentially very helpful to have somebody who can um, sort of uh, bridge between the work that's going on in the White House and the work that's going on in the agency. Um, so to have Portia there, to have Tom there, and of course to have Eric there as the Deputy Assistant Secretary. Um, you know, those are all incredibly good signs. Definitely, I think you'll see things coming out of the agency that are very consistent with best practices on the ground. Uh, you can already see some of the, the skills agenda playing out, so um, hopefully everybody has seen the announcement of these Youth Career Connect grants. That is part of the high school reform bucket for the skills agenda. Um, those are being administered through the Department of Labor. It's to connect um, uh, career and technical education and, post -sec and traditional post-secondary education or occupational training in much more intentional ways to prepare people to prepare young people for careers and for post-secondary education. Um, it's $100 million, um, uh, and that those grants, those grants are in process. Uh, so you're starting to see that connection from the White House's skills agenda down to the activities in the agency, and I think we'll see more of that um, over the next few months. Uh, we, yeah. um, so the Department of Education has also been very active. We don't have new leadership there, but we do have a new push, um, particularly out of the Office of Vocational and Adult Education. So that's still Brenda Dan Messier and um, Johan Uven. Um, but we had this report that came out in the fall of last year, the um, OECD, um, called the PIAC, and it looks at um, adult competencies and adult literacy, numeracy, and problem-solving skills um, across 27 countries, including the United States. Um, probably to no one's great surprise, the results showed that the United States lags behind most other developed nations um, in literacy, numeracy, um, and problem solving in technology-rich environments. They find that we have about 33 million people with low basic skills, um, and, and there's tremendous unmet need, um, both for people who are enrolled in adult basic education but would like more, and people who just don't have access to any um, adult basic education but would like uh, to have that access. And so in response to that report, OBE is um, trying to develop a strategy to address this basic skills problem. They're doing listening sessions right now around the country. Um, they brought on new staff and new capacity to try and develop a blueprint or a plan or whatever you want to call it. They're shooting for April, so it's going pretty fast. Um, uh, but they would like to bring new attention and new energy to this issue, I think, in a, in a, in a serious way. So that's, that's, that's very encouraging. Um, the Department of Education, even beyond OVE, though, is looking at some of these skills issues. So just recently, we've seen coming out of the Department of Ed um, a request for proposals on new ways to administer financial aid. So they have a, I forget what it's called, an Office of Experimental Design or something like that, where they're looking for experimental ways to make financial aid work better, including for non-traditional students. Um, they're also interested in developing a rating system for post-secondary institutions. Um, some people shorthand that as like college report cards. Um, but to make sure that consumers have better access to data as they're making decisions about post-secondary education. So we're, again, we're sort of starting to see some of this stuff play through what's starting at the White House, playing, down through the, playing out down through the agencies. <clears throat> How about 
uh, yes. Okay, and we're actually also seeing um, agencies that you would think would be interested in skills but have not traditionally paid a lot of attention to this. In particular, the Department of Commerce, um, right, supposed to be focusing on the needs of business, helping um, uh, companies and corporations uh, grow and prosper. So you'd think they would have a long history of working on skills issues, but they do not. Um, they have new secretary, Secretary Penny Pritzker, um, <clears throat> who has been confirmed and is serving now. She actually has a long history of working on skills issues. Uh, she was involved very early on from this, the beginning of uh, President Obama's administration in the PRAB, which was the, economic, the President's Economic Recovery Advisory Board, and then it morphed into the Jobs Council, and she was part of that. Um, skills for America's Future, which is an organization outside of the White House, but connected to the White House, that works on connecting community colleges and employers. She was the chair of their board. So she, she just has a lot of expertise and a lot of background around these skills issues, particularly from an employer's perspective. And she has brought that into the Department of Commerce. She's already announced a four-part agenda that includes a new focus on meeting the skill needs of employers. Um, and she has made very clear that her goal is to work closely with the Department of Labor and the Department of Education to better align resources and better align initiatives so that as workers are getting the training that they need, it's connected to employers and that employers are getting the skilled workers that they need. Um, so new energy and I think new opportunities to work with an agency that um, we have not had a lot of opportunity to work with in the past. And then um, just going back to uh, SNAP e and um, the Department of Agriculture, FNS, the Food and Nutrition Services, is very interested in this program. There's a lot of new focus internally in the agency on SNAP e and um, I think they have started to realize that it is a potentially good resource, and um, if you do it right, you can actually do a lot to help SNAP recipients um, get to the skills they need to get to stable employment, to earn enough so that they can support themselves and their families, and eventually, ultimately, hopefully, not need to rely on SNAP benefits anymore to, um, for their nutrition needs. They're in the process right now of trying to um, develop a strategy to help uh, local communities or programs or states figure out how to do more with SNAP ENT. They are actively promoting expanding ENT um, and they're really trying to think about how to make sure that these programs are paying more attention to training. In, um, in the past, SNAP ENT in some places, you know, worst case scenario, it's been used to sanction people off of SNAP. In other places, it's been very, very light touch, um, a little bit of job search um, or some very light, you know, resume writing help. Um, and they, I think they have um, heard us and they understand now that um, uh, this is a good resource and you can really do a lot of skill building and training through ENT. And they're starting to look for potential sites where they can work with the local community to test new models. Um, and, you know, that's something that we're happy to help with. We're in conversation with them. Um, if you are in a community where you have an interest in this, you know, please feel free to reach out to any of us because uh, we, we want to be as helpful as we can. We'd like to see this program succeed. Um, as Angela mentioned, they're working on the Farm Bill now. We do think that there's going to um, be a new pilot program in the conference report to um, help encourage some experimentation with SNAP ENT um, and some new uh, reporting requirements to better understand what, what communities are doing with SNAP ENT. Um, so I, I, I think there's going to be ongoing attention to this program. All right, uh, I think that's the quick run through of the administration. I do, you know, I, I, we're running out of time, so I, I kind of I went pretty fast, but I do want to make sure people, I want to leave you with the impression that this is something that the administration is interested in. We expect to see some announcements. We, like I said, I think we'll see the State of the Union. I think we'll see things in the budget. Um, so this is a place where I think we should all be paying attention um, and making sure that we're, we're influencing that conversation. All right, so once again, if you have a question, please click on the hand on the, on the control panel, uh, or else you can type in your question. I already have a couple questions that came in while you're talking. Um, one of them is, will OVA's emphasis on basic skills have any effect on we as service delivery? So, for example, literacy and numeracy measures for youth, credential attainment for youth and adults. Uh, so the short answer is I don't think so, right? The House bill has been passed already. The Senate has been through the committee. Um, unless there's somebody who's willing to tackle these issues as, as amendments on the floor, 
I don't think so. I do. So you know, I do want to say I think there's a gap. Um, this is one of those issues where I think we still have some work to do. The fact that the adult basic ed state grants in FY14 are funded at the post sequester level, even as we have this new data, even as we have this new this new activity. Um, I'm getting a lot of feedback off of somebody's phone. Thank you. Um, you know, so even if, though we have this activity, I'm not sure policymakers have really processed the problem, the scope of the problem, or the scale of the unmet need. Um, so I do think that's a place where we need to continue to really try and educate policymakers and make sure they understand what's going on. Um, but I, I don't expect to see this reflected in the short term, probably in the current WEA legislation. All right. Well, um, there's another question. Uh, what plans does the administration have to employ the long-term unemployed? Uh, I, I, I don't want to get in front of the administration. Um, I, I think what they would like to do, you know, their concern is really on the employer side. I think they have some research that shows um, you know, there are some large employers in particular who make hiring decisions based on people's unemployment status, and I, I think they'd like to work with employers um, to put a stop to some of that. Um, but they're also, I think, I think it's fair and safe to say that they're very interested in the role of industry and sector partnerships in helping to serve the long-term unemployed and bridging that gap um, back to employers. Um, so. You know, I think our hope is that we'll start to see some new focus and some new emphasis out of the White House on the role of um, those partnerships and that training capacity. Uh, is anyone discussing public service employment as approach to the long-term unemployed? Not really. Not really. Um, so I don't see any uh, other questions. Uh, Yeah, I, I don't see any other questions. Okay. So if I uh, want to go ahead and wrap it up. Sure. So that's very good timing because we're basically right at the end anyway. I do want to say if people have other questions or if there's things that you think of later on, please don't hesitate. Go to the next slide, Jen. Please don't hesitate to contact me or Angela or anybody on our staff. We're all more than happy to try and answer whatever questions you have. Um, you will get an email, I believe, next week that has a link to this PowerPoint. I'm um, a link to the table. If you want to see the report that we did on comprehensive immigration reform, we can also make sure that um, uh, we can get that to you if you want it. So um, uh, don't hesitate to, to let us know if there are other things that we can do to help. Uh, anything else, Josh? Uh, no, that's, that's it. Okay, so. then. Thanks, everybody.